Hello, everyone. Welcome to another collateral onboarding call from MakerDAO. My name is Juan. I'm the facilitator from the SES core unit. And uh, today we have the brief drop, um, so commercial real estate assets. Uh, we have the team that are going to be presenting and telling us everything about, uh, about this token. So Ben, if you want to take it away. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Juan. Uh, so hello and welcome, uh, collateral onboarding call for, for Reef. Um, I am excited to, uh, to present to you today. I feel like we've got a tremendous opportunity here for, uh, for a, a growing market and, and a real opportunity to take uh, considerable market share away from uh, kind of existing banks, um, both uh, kind of tier two credit unions, as well as uh, some class A stuff. And so it's quite a bit of an opportunity, some good products. Looking forward to sharing uh, that information with you today. Uh, I also have our first asset originator uh, on the call, Forge and Foster. So be uh, uh, joined by uh, CEO and partner, uh, Joe Accardi, as well as uh, partner and chairman of the advisory board, Vensel Hoberg. Uh, so gentlemen, if you just say hello, uh, just to introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'm Joe Cardi. Thank you. Awesome. So we will uh, we'll hear from them a little later in the presentation. Uh, but I just I'll start things off uh, and just talk a little more about the Reef side. Um, so Reef Financial is a newly formed entity. Uh, we're facilitating the uh, uh, kind of issuance of commercial real estate loans to mid market private real estate investment managers. Uh, in North America, starting in, uh, the, in Canadian markets. Uh, my name is Ben Ames. I'm CEO at Reef, as well as CIO and partner at Forge and Foster. Uh, Reef will be uh, Reef's working with Centrifuge, um, and it'll be an asset as part of Tin Lake. Uh, they will be uh, helping us to uh, uh, secure, uh, basically, the, the secured charges. More the charges on the real estate properties will be secured as. NFTs and owned by uh, owned by Reef. Uh, so this is the structure of the pool. Uh, pretty typical type structuring where it's made up of 90% being the uh, the drop tokens and 10% being the junior tin tokens as a part of this special purpose vehicle, uh, which will, like I had mentioned, hold the hold the title uh, of the loans as NFTs. Uh, to talk a little bit more about the reef pool, uh, it's essentially made up of two products, a uh, first and second position product, which I'll talk about in the next couple of slides. The structure, as I had mentioned, 90% being the drop, 10% being uh, kind of tin tokens. And then there is uh, kind of further alignment in uh, the reef pool where, whereby reef will provide 10% uh, of the capital through the pool. And then on the, the asset originator side, on Forge and Foster side, uh, with every asset that they own, they commit to at least 20% of the equity uh, in each of those uh, investments. So to talk a little bit more about the products, uh, two products, like I had mentioned, there's a first position product and it's used for acquisition, uh, refinance of existing assets, uh, either for equity takeout or for cost savings on that first position capital. Uh, and then I do want to stress kind of with both products is that this is kind of more like growth capital. It's more kind of bridge financing uh, where we see quite a bit of an opportunity. And so definitely in this first position uh, product, it's uh, primarily kind of used as a bridge to get that, that A bank type first position loan uh, for kind of like B or C quality assets uh, and A in some, in some cases where that first position financing in its current form is not, uh, is not available. Uh, the rates for this product be somewhere between the four to 6%. Uh, and then the second position product uh, is used for renovations, development, or leasehold and tenant improvements, essentially all used for construction, uh, for value add uh, activities to the existing assets. Uh, a lot of the time with the, this construction, there's, there's draw schedules involved. And so it won't be a, of the entire amount will be provided for that construction. 
uh, it kind of done through a, through a draw schedule uh, in, in, in most cases. Um, and the rates for this product are in that eight to 12% um, uh, per annum. So the collateral for the reef pool, essentially what uh, reef is uh, acquiring in terms of the asset are, uh, are, those, two, are those two products, are uh, charges against the property. Um, so similar to a mortgage, uh, it will have that, uh, that priority charge on value add commercial real estate projects. Uh, for the type of properties that we're looking for, uh, they're all income producing commercial and industrial properties. So there is uh, existing income coming in that can, that can handle uh, the, uh, the payments of those, uh, those mortgages. Um, the maximum loan to values for, for the products are, uh, for the first position is 70%, and for the second position, it's up to 80%. I touched on it a, a briefly at the beginning, but there is uh, some kind of co-investment uh, as a part of this pool. Uh, so as I mentioned, Reef uh, committing to 10% of the capital uh, as part of the pool. We have uh, 2 million of dye ready to, uh, to kind of seed the pool. I do wanna stress that kind of the existing structure with the asset originator Ford and Foster has been ongoing for uh, kind of a long period of time. And so it's not a uh, entirely new, uh, it's a kind of a new entity rather than and a new product. Um, but we're, what Reef is, is committing to that first kind of 2 million to seed the pool. And then it is an evergreen fund. And so there'll be additional uh, capital provided by Reef uh, to follow. Uh, and then Forge and Foster, as I had mentioned, has the opportunity to invest in the Reef pool if they consider but their focused investment is on the equity for those uh, properties. And they're committed to uh, at least 20% of every, uh, of all the 20% of the equity for all the properties that, uh, that they have going forward as well as that they own today. Um, the, uh, I'll go into kind of the, the waterfall of capital a little bit later, but to confirm this is considered kind of first loss capital behind the two mortgage charges. Uh, and would uh, they'd absorb basically the losses if there are any um, uh, to the uh, to the uh, the structure of the investment? Uh, to talk a little bit about kind of mitigating risk as reef, uh, both kind of now and into the future as as we uh, we do scale, uh, we are uh, using a kind of a third party verification of property values uh, for uh, for assessing the value of each asset. Obviously, there'll be some underwriting on reef side. Uh, but we'll want to rely on a, uh, a third-party verification. I talked a little bit about the loan to values already, uh, but then being 70% for the first position product and 80% for the second position product. Uh, and then the use of funds is interesting. Um, the use of funds I'd, I'd mentioned uh, kind of briefly at the beginning as well, uh, but for definitely for the second position product being kind of the value add loan, uh, it's only used for activities kind of directly increasing the value of the property whether that be uh, tenant incentives, um, construction, or just kind of um, um, uh, build outs of the kind of on the existing building. Um, so definitely kind of value add with that second position product. Uh, we'll also do checks uh, both on the entity borrowing as well as the property to ensure there's no liens and that all current obligations are in good standing. Um, this next part is very important, uh, the insurance and the covenants on, on, the, uh, on the asset. Um, so there's, uh, there would be some language in place to ensure that the borrower doesn't further encumber the properties without approval from, uh, from the reef pool. And on the insurance side, we want to ensure that there is sufficient replacement insurance it provided, uh, meaning that if there was some act of God event, whether it be a fire or a flood, uh, whatever that may be, there's insurance there to uh, provide not only the damages, but kind of the replacement value of the property to ensure that we, in the event something were to happen, there's no additional costs on uh, the owners or the, the mortgagees to, uh, to get uh, the property back to the, the value that it was, uh, was prior. Uh, finally, under underwriting. So we, we do have kind of 14 plus years experience in underwriting uh, commercial industrial real estate. Uh, the issuer being Reef will underwrite uh, kind of all the owner's financials and the income projections for the property to ensure that there is uh, one opportunity to grow the value of the asset, uh, but two kind of sufficient income to 
to, to be able to handle the, the interest payments. Uh, and so with that, I, I do want to hand it over to, uh, to Joe Accardi, but just before I do, I'll give a kind of a brief high level of Forge and Foster, uh, the initial asset originator through the reef pool, uh, the 14 plus year track record of successfully investing in commercial and residential real estate. Uh, currently uh, does, does change quite, quite uh, frequently, does grow uh, quite fast in terms of uh, AUM, but currently there's 250 million uh, Can Canadian in assets under management. And uh, there's some additional partners uh, as well as part of the group, um, but uh, made up of uh, CPPIB, uh, including former managing director and head of real estate being Vento Hoberg, who we'll chat later on uh, in, uh, in this presentation. Uh, but with that, I will hand it over to Joe to, uh, to talk a little bit more about Forge and Foster and talk a little more about himself and, uh, and the future. Thank you, Ben. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak today. Uh, one thing that's for sure in the past couple of years, especially, is the world is changing fast and that's no different than our business. And we've seen quite a bit of, of change and, and this is something that we're excited about uh, to be part of. Um, so I'm Joe Cardi, uh, CEO and partner of Forge and Foster. Uh, Forge and Foster is a, a, a research and growth oriented uh, real estate firm and we specialize in taking assets primarily in the greater Hamilton region um, and uh, buying those assets and increasing the value. Most recently, we've gotten into Ontario and Canada, um, but uh, definitely uh, Hamilton-centric in, in the GTHA. So for uh, the past few years, um, you see that uh, we have our track record up here in front of us. Uh, overall, we've, we've gotten to a 33% IRR uh, over the past five years. If you notice the exit date column, you can see that uh, the earliest one was 2016 or 2015 there. So these are closed investments that we've done uh, in the region, primarily in the Hamilton area. Uh, just to go through some themes and some strategies that have worked for us here, we've done the brick and beam post um, mixed use communities, including uh, retail and apartments. Uh, and also some, some retail, traditional retail, and uh, more, more recently, we've been getting into uh, some flex space industrial. If you go into the, the next slide, you can see this is what uh, hasn't closed yet. This is currently on our books right now, uh, part of the 250 million assets under management. Um, if you know the Hamilton region in Canada, real estate's been going really well, so we are expected to hit these IRRs, and it's showing uh, about a 20 per six IR. 26% IR on these projects, which are yet to close. And these are the deals that we've been doing in the past few years. In terms of uh, what we do, so I think, uh, you know, we, we take research, we try and go in growth regions, which for us tr traditionally has been uh, Southern Ontario. Um, we take, go into growth assets, which we're finding here, are some of the main targets that we're going after right now. Value add flex industrial, really good asset class simply because almost any tenant can locate in there and more and more office space or flex users are starting to take over these one story plans rather than being in traditional offices. So that's been a really successful as a class for us when we see growth in that next five years. Tech and medical office. Uh, this is one that uh, we're, we're in, we're near McMaster um, University. And so there's a lot of research and a lot of educated um, companies that are coming into the area or growing out of this area. So we've invested in, in the McMaster Innovation Park area. Another area we see growth in is film. Um, that's one where uh, you know we've been able to um, uh, see. This is with Eon Studio Group, and uh, this is a, a district that's close to the to Toronto and Hamilton has a Go Train station there. Plus, film is one of the fastest growing industries in Hamilton right now. We saw that early. We're invested in Eon Studio Group. We're also part of the Hamilton Film Studios, which is another group that is that is investing in film. So. With Netflix and Disney and everything else that's happening, um, Hamilton has some tax credits that are beneficial towards Toronto, and Toronto has the Toronto Film Festival, so we've been investing in that successfully. The other thing that's really interesting for us is, uh, you know, in the past hundred years or so, um, you know, Ontario cottage country has been been visited by some of the wealthiest people in the Northeast. Um, that has continued, but it's continued so much so that uh, you know prices are getting into the millions. So it's kind of uh, not approachable by most, uh, by most, I guess, middle class, middle upper class uh, individuals. So we've invested in, in these resorts, which are 
typically RV resorts, which really haven't been uh, repurposed uh, since the 50s or 60s. So we've been investing in those successfully and the demand has been incredible. Uh, another thing that we've been doing is tiny home manufacturing. Uh, I personally believe that the, the, the housing crisis affordability problem can be solved through manufacturing housing. I think there's uh, 67 acres per Canadian in Canada right now. There's no really land issue. Uh, it's really just about constructing these units. In Canada, you can only have a construction season about eight months a year. But in a factory uh, covered, you can, you can build 365, 24 hours a day. Don't have to worry about being too hot or being rainy. So we've invested in this. We're planning to put them on resorts in some of our manufactured home communities. And we can construct uh, at about $100,000 in areas where houses sell for six times that. So we have a, a great cost advantage. And if you look at some of these finishes here, uh, you can see that when you're, when you're inside one of these tiny homes or tiny cottages, that the condo quality really shows up with laundry and dishwashers and big sinks and, and high quality finishes. Uh, this is something that's really interesting. I mentioned the, the fast positive change in the past two years in our business. Uh, we've uh, gotten into some interesting sorts of capital, front funder, buy properly and Addy. Uh, we're currently Addy's biggest, uh, biggest partner. I think they're the biggest um, alternative digital capital raiser in Canada right now. Uh, and we've done uh, a handful of successful deals with them. So we see huge growth over there. And then another big thing that uh, Forge and Foster has been a leader in is this alternative income. So, I mean, there's always the monthly uh, tenant paying your rent. But uh, we're finding through Airbnb and through, uh, you know, some creative uses with Made in Millworks and, and the film district, uh, we've been able to add uh, quite a bit of gross income. And we think that's just the start of these uh, alternative incomes and digital capital. So we're happy to be the leaders in both in, in our region. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. Uh, definitely, uh, it's always uh, I kind of know when you're on the inside kind of the exciting things that are happening but anytime we can explain it to uh to people outside of the of the business it's uh it's certainly uh kind of uh, quite a bit going on and and definitely on on trend and capitalizing on lots of value definitely awesome so uh with that and kind of kind of running off of what joe had mentioned uh in regarding to some of the, the kind of types of buildings uh, that Forge and Foster is uh, uh, is investing in. I just wanted to go through a, kind of a, a sample deal. Uh, this is our kind of latest close. Uh, so we just sold this property, and uh, we're still kind of ironing out the uh, the final uh, the final numbers and the dis distributions to uh, to investors. And so uh, I'll, I'll share some of the kind of the the early kind of findings later on, but uh, definitely. Uh, hasn't been uh, solidified yet, but as you'll see, it's kind of a, a quite successful investment and definitely typical of uh, kind of the kind of bread and butter of what Ford and Foster undertakes. Um, and so this property located in Dundas, Ontario at one head street, kind of right at the end of a cul-de-sac, uh, uh, type of like a BC type office industrial product, just over 120,000 square feet. Uh, the going in purchase price was uh, about $78 per square foot and the building sat on just under 10 acres. Uh, so the total purchase price was nine and a half million. Uh, the point I do want to stress here is that uh, definitely significant income in the property on acquisition. There was a going in cap rate of 5.7%. And then uh, there were some existing vacancies, uh, but uh, all the tenants were on month to month tenancies. Um, and so as you can see, just kind of from the overview here, like this type of product is, is not really looked on favorably from uh, kind of an A-class lender, especially if not the, the lack of uh, leases. Uh, and, and so uh, that's kind of where the, the opportunity lies uh, for REIT. Um, but this is kind of just the kind of a, an example structure of typically how it would have uh, uh, kind of would have played out. I'll note on this investment, uh, the structure was a little bit different just because there was a large, a larger equity investor involved. Um, but as a typical Forge and Foster deal, this is what it would look like. Um, and so acquisition price, like I mentioned, nine and a half million, closing costs at about 500,000, uh, construction costs estimated around 800,000 uh, and with carrying costs of around 100,000. So the total capital required would be 10.9 million. Uh, the structure would be followed as such. There'd be a first position financing of seven and a half million. Uh, in this case, this would be a, a great opportunity for a reef type first position product. As I'd mentioned before, is the lack of leases 
and the general uh, state of the building would not let a first position, a typical class A bank type first position lender uh, lend on it. Um, and so in this case, uh, the deal was structured with a vendor take back mortgage, uh, being that the seller provided uh, the first position financing to help facilitate the deal. Obviously quite a bit of opportunity for Reese to grab significant market share with this product just by understanding uh, the value add component to these types of properties. Uh, there's a second position uh, loan of about 900,000. Forge and Foster Investor Capital made up 2 million and Forge and Foster Capital of, uh, of 500,000 with total capital being uh, kind of around that 10.9 million number. Um, so that'd be kind of the, the going in structure, the, uh, the initial kind of uh, assessment that Forge and Foster would, uh, would kind of go to market for the capital raise. Uh, as I'll share later on, it did change a little bit. There was a second position loan that was increased and the investor equity cash equity checks were a little bit different, um, but this kind of just kind of the going in type sample structure. Um, and so this is where the kind of the distributions in the waterfall, as I touched on earlier, uh, kind of get outlined. Uh, in the event of the exit, there'd be a repayment of the first position loan, definitely the first position security. Um, and then secondly, be paying out that second position loan, there'd be return of the investor capital, not the forge and foster capital, uh, as well as a 10% hurdle, uh, hurdle rate to those investors. Uh, and then from there, forge and foster catches up to that return of investor capital, uh, as well as the 10% hurdle. And then the re remaining amount is split 50-50 between forge and foster investors and forge and foster. Uh, so this to give you a kind of more idea of the type of asset on acquisition, uh, like I'd mentioned, definitely kind of B or C type quality product, uh, B in terms of the, 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 uh, the building, C in terms of the, uh, the washroom, um, as you can see there in the middle, uh, but definitely just kind of mom and pop owned asset, haven't have owned it for 30 plus years. I've never really put in too much work into the building. Uh, there's probably not too much uh, debt on the property. And so whatever rent they, they cash uh, is all kind of bonus to them. They're not really looking at maximizing value. Um, and this kind of the, the bread and butter type uh, property that we would look to acquire um, uh, being Forge and Foster. Uh, and so this is the kind of the after. So this is the work that Forge and Foster would do uh, to the property to kind of increase that value first and foremost. Uh, is a, kind of a real uh, undertaking in the first kind of 90 to 120 days. Uh, there's a rebrand of the, of the property uh, to the, the peak there, commercial cul-de-sac. Uh, there's a, upgrades to the exterior, uh, including um, kind of any kind of roof work or mechanical engineering that needs done, um, but definitely kind of adding to the, uh, or, or giving the, the property a bit of a facelift through a, through a paint. Uh, there's some murals there outlined as well to the kind of local birds in the air paying homage to uh, uh, to that. And but just really kind of showing pride in ownership and making a big impact in the first kind of 90 to 120 days just helps with kind of keeping the momentum of the asset rolling, helps with getting new tenants in, that kind of thing. And then you can see kind of an example of the uh, kind of the space uh, in the end state. Uh, it's not doesn't really take too much. It's more just kind of a cleaning up, uh, painting getting uh, a decent kind of washroom in there, um, but just ensuring that the, uh, the unit is sufficient for uh, kind of these kind of uh, flex industrial type uses. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, this is kind of like a sample uh, distribution. Uh, so uh, as, as mentioned before, like the specific figures haven't been finalized yet. They're still, uh, the sale was pretty recent. So there's some, some uh, figures to still update. Um, but we're, at, we're expecting a 2.13x investor equity multiple on the investment. Um, and then the, the breakdown of the waterfall would be kind of repaying that first position, uh, in this case, first position BTB to the, uh, to the owner. Uh, the second position payout, uh, return of investor capital, 10% uh, hurdle to investors per annum, and then the Forge and Foster catch up, uh, the remaining amount split 50-50 between Forge and Foster investors and Forge and Foster. Um, so this was actually a, quite a successful investment. It was un originally underwritten as a four-year equity investment, um, ended up being a one-year, bought out early. Um, uh, but I do want to stress like kind of, this is the equity type structure. Uh, the, the debt type structure would fall under kind of a, a different timeframe, uh, 12 months with the option to renew for another 12. 
um, but uh, but just kind of wanted to highlight how Forge and Foster uh, handles that uh, that investment distribution and handles their existing investors. So to talk a little bit more and kind of expand upon uh, upon Reese growth plan, uh, we are starting with our initial asset ledger being Forge and Foster. It's about 250 million in AUM with Forge and Foster. So there's quite a bit of uh, existing AUM that could be uh, could be financed through the pool. Uh, and so that's definitely the kind of first stage is, is just working with that initial asset originator. Um, we have a lot of relationships with other asset originators in uh, the real estate space in Ontario, uh, especially kind of around the Hamilton surrounding areas. Um, and so that would be kind of the next phase to our growth plan. Uh, we definitely have uh, I've brought up the uh, kind of the opportunity to uh, to a number of other asset originators who are all very interested, um, and uh, so there's quite a bit of room to uh, to grow there. And I'll explain. I'll kind of highlight a few more that we have within our network in the next slide. Um, but from there, we definitely see uh, this type of product being uh, readily uh, accepted by the Canadian market. Um, definitely uh, kind of falls under. Uh, similar uh, types of uh, first position lender requirements across Canada. And just with our experience in the Canadian markets, uh, we'll be able to see kind of where there's a lot of kind of value to be derived. And we can definitely uh, scale this uh, product quite efficiently across Canada and really get a lot of security under management uh, quite quickly and efficiently. Um, and then from there, uh, the North American markets, uh, namely being the US, is also available to us. Um, and, uh, and, and qu obviously quite a large market. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity out there as well. Uh, so I did talk a little bit about a kind of our, our, uh, our network on the kind of the Ontario market. Um, and these would be kind of the, the typical groups that we'd look to, uh, to go out and, uh, and, and bring on as additional asset originators. Um, and I, I wanted to highlight, there, there are more, but I wanted to highlight kind of the different types of uh, asset originators that we, we have uh, in our stable. Uh, the first being kind of similar to Forge and Foster, um, being kind of your uh, your typical uh, renovator to provide value add, um, being uh, Malium. Uh, so they're an asset manager based here in Hamilton with uh, kind of significant holdings, uh, be some of it we'd look to, to kind of bring into this pool. Um, in addition, Harmony Resorts. So this is actually all, uh, kind of a new venture uh, that Forge and Foster is undertaking. It's co-owned though, 50% by Forge and Foster and 50% by Wavecom Capital, a group out of Toronto. Um, but this is the, the uh, kind of the, the uh, entity or the originator that's gonna be tackling the uh, kind of the cottage land type uh, uh, investments that uh, Joe had outlined. Um, so there's Harmony as well. Uh, and then also we have a couple of groups, Core Urban being a, a pretty prominent Hamilton developer, as well as New Horizon Development Group based out of Burlington, but doing a lot of work across uh, Southern Ontario, uh, two groups with very significant holdings and ones that we could, we have relationships with who'd be interested in a product uh, like this. And if the uh, kind of onboarding of uh, originators isn't, uh, isn't going as quickly as we would like, um, we have relationships with some uh, loan brokers that we've used through Forge and Foster uh, or just know within our network, uh, namely one being Avena Capital, uh, loan broker based in Ontario with exposure to uh, the GTA, um, being the greater Toronto area, uh, exposure to kind of other Ontario markets, and they've done uh, just over a billion in deals funded. So as you can see, it's just kind of quite a bit of opportunity to onboard additional originators to this pool. So with that, and to talk more about the uh, the kind of the expansion plans, and just to go over the the Canadian market and the uh, and the North American market, I, I'll hand it over now to Wenzel Holberg, who's a partner, like I mentioned, partner and chairman of the advisory board uh, at Forge and Foster. But as you can see, has uh, quite an impressive resume, and uh, very lucky to have him uh, as a part of the uh, Forge and Foster uh, partnership. And so, Wenzel, I'll, I'll leave it uh, with you to uh, to continue on. Yeah, thank you, Ben. My name is Wenzel Holberg. Um, as you can see, I've been, uh, you know, active for 30 years in Europe, uh, North America, and Asia as a real estate investor. I've been with, uh, you know, I've been CEO of a European management platform, Pan European. I've been MD for kind of a pension plan investment board in London, and I've also been involved in in retail and a global investing German open fund in the past. And I really want to take. Uh, 
the time because I know it's a global audience to say um, to explain to you why why investment in Canada or in Ontario is is relevant um, on a global perspective. Why this is an interactive region. And Ben, if you can hit the slide. Um, I mean, what you see here is the fastest growing cities in North America. I think, uh, given given the politics and the immigration policy uh, of the two countries, what you see here is that four out of ten, um, you know, cities in North America are Canadian, uh, with the top growing absolute numbers of population. Um, you know, obviously, uh, some of these Canadian cities here are smaller than Toronto, so on a on a percentage level, they're growing even faster. But you know, Toronto, the gateway cities like Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, as you can see here, are the net uh, beneficiaries of an incredible international immigration. And you know, maybe a lot of it, you know, which would have geared in the last couple of decades towards the U.S. Uh, a lot of those people from uh, all over the world, including myself, um, you know, are immigrating to Canada because of you know, positive, you know, positive migration um, policies. Um, and you know, where are they going? I mean, basically they're going to Toronto, Montreal and Vancouver and the Europeans maybe more to Toronto, um, you know, and then uh, in Montreal and then the, the Asian um, population more towards Vancouver. And you see there's an incredible uh, population inflow. And you know, when you add up these numbers here, there's, there's probably four to five million uh, international immigration coming to Canadian cities. And the population is only 38 million people. So you're looking at, you know, 12% over four years or 3% of growth, um, you know, per annum in the cities. And, you know, this is a G7 country with lots of stability, you know, um, you know, and, uh, you know, a secure currency and secure politics. And you're almost getting an emerging market growth from population. And of course, then you also have a bit of urbanization within Canada. But the, the international immigration is really interesting. And I think when you look at those cities or the greater city environments here, um, you know, the reason they are growing, um, you know, much faster than the national average is because the, the cities are such magnets um, for intercultural immigration and, and the liberal lifestyle. So next one, uh, from a real estate perspective, um, you can see this reflected here where you know, the gateway cities have the best parameters and the best real estate environment, um, you know, compared to the more prairie and, and, and the rural uh, areas of Canada. And, and so you can see that both from investor demand, capital available, development opportunity, um, you know, these gateway cities and their regions are really, um, you know, quite ahead and positive. Um, next one is more, you know, what we call the asset classes of food groups, you, you see here both, um, you know, what we do a lot um, as, as asset classes, if you want, is, is warehousing, medical offers, um, you know, flex offers, you know, all of these, you know, mentioned here in the in green investment prospects. And you also see that, you know, kind of our research development, you know, low income oriented, you know, RV living, you know, all, all these, you know, new asset classes that provide good income uh, metrics, uh, good cash flow are actually quite successful, you know, here in Canada and in our region. And, and then there's this, you know, incredible demand we had on the, on the slide before for fulfillment center and logistics. And we are not primarily in this, we are in warehouse space, but not in logistics space. But when you just look at the logistics market that has taken off globally, um, where you know there's really no, no new, you know, no place to be found. The vacancy is is uh, below one percent in the gateway cities. We have three-year growth rates in rent in Toronto of seventy-five percent, Montreal fifty-six, London, Ontario fifty percent growth rates over three years in in rents. Uh, the cap rates are going down globally and also here. Um, and, and therefore, you know, this market is growing so aggressively that our space, which is often kind of warehousing space that is existing and below replacement cost is attracting a lot of users. And, you know, it pushes our rents up and then pushes our returns up. And, you know, our property is really, you know, well cash flowing and the cap rates, 
you know, we are buying between five and six cap rates, um, you know, on these assets. And if you look at, you know, how the cap rates have compressed in, in, in the United States or in Europe on this asset class, you know, down to, you know, three and a half, four, um, you know, across the regions with much higher rents, I think you're getting in at a very attractive price, uh, both on a, you know, return level, but also an absolute level per square foot. So, so we, we think it's an attractive region. It's basically growth market, you know, kind of dynamics in a very stable economy. And, you know, obviously we wish it would get bigger, but, you know, it's growing at a fast pace. So thank you for that. And over to Chris. Awesome. Thank you, Vento. Uh, so yeah, as, as Bento mentioned, that uh, ends our our uh, presentation, and and welcome any questions. Nice, thank you guys. Are there are there any questions from the people here smarter than me? So I don't know, Planet X, Seb, you guys uh, have probably more a better I, background for this. I might have missed something here, but uh, the exact relationship between the uh, reef and uh, Forge and Foster. Could you perhaps detail that a bit? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a separate, uh, two separate entities. Uh, Forge and Foster will be the first uh, asset originator into the reef pool. Uh, but obviously there's relationship there and, and uh, myself uh, being a partner with Forge and Foster uh, as well as uh, 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 as part of Reef, so there's there's a there's a kind of a uh, a relationship there, but they'll be structured as two different entities. All right, and the let's see, Reef, Reef, uh, uh, okay, Fortune Foster here provides capital and and nothing more. Is that it? Uh, Forge and Foster is the asset originator, so they have they'll be purchasing the assets. Reef would provide capital to to Forge and Foster uh, for the acquisition, um, refinancing of the assets, or as well as the value add loans. Uh, and so they would they would manage the asset. They would use that capital to grow the value, and then be paying a, a, an interest rate similar to like a mortgage back to uh, back to Reef. Um, oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, second question. Uh, I don't know if I'm. Uh, perhaps anyone else wants to say something more. It has to do with the the time horizon horizon for the lending. Uh, I saw briefly on your chart it varied from two months to four years. Could you uh, talk a little bit about what you what are you aiming at here? Yeah, for sure. I realized that I probably made it a little more confusing than I needed to be in, in terms of the presentation afterwards. But uh, uh, the information that was provided uh, under the kind of the example deal structure, that was kind of forge and foster investor timelines. And so uh, that, that's on the equity investment side uh, through their existing, uh, existing pool of investors. For REIT specifically, uh, the loans will be structured on 12 month terms with the option to renew for an additional 12 months. Uh, so tip, kind of typically that 12 or 24 month time frame for, uh, for those loans where uh, they'll either be a kind of refinance to take out or a sale of the property. All right. Then. Um, okay. Uh, I, I don't have any more questions right now. Oh, hi, it's Eric. If I could follow up on that, is Coral involved in the transaction? I know they're the owner of Reef, but is there any support in the being provided through a Coral? Yeah, basically for the uh, the structuring of the special purpose vehicle, Coral's kind of handling that side as well as the uh, the relationship with Centrifuge and kind of building the product. But Reef itself will be a standalone entity and. And will handle the the day to day and the the management of the fund. Okay, let me ask. You are, I think, are you CEO of Reef? I I I'm CEO of Reef, correct. Okay, and you also have a, a senior role with Forge and Foster. Correct. I think one thing I did want to ask: if God forbid there became some kind of financial distress in an investment, you yeah. could wind up in two different seats. One is an equity investor; the other is a debt investor. Where, in a sense. How, how would you manage that? Because you have yeah. two sets of interests. They're not always aligned. 
Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the way that the charges would work on the wreath side, uh, kind of the charges tied to the asset, uh, means that it'll always be first loss capital. Um, in the event of that there's, there's kind of there's a default or some, something that, that, that happens to the, uh, to the, to the, the funding that makes reef have to kind of work out a default agreement. Uh, the sale would cover that, that first position financing uh, as a part of the, the kind of the first stage to the waterfall. And then the equity at the end would be okay, basically Forge and Foster equity or essentially uh, my ownership would be last priority uh in terms of the in terms of the waterfall the distribution of capital i mean i guess yeah. i'm asking are, are you comfortable because it feels like you're going to wind up fighting against yourself in a way if there's if there's distress because you, you have to, you wear two different hats that won't be perfectly aligned in a distress yeah i, I mean for for forge on forge and foster side like uh we, we've we've never had a an, an instance where there would be a, a default in terms of a mortgage uh, we've had investments that maybe didn't go as well as we had hoped, but it only affected what, uh, like our Forge and Foster, the equity on that okay. side, um, but no, no defaults to date. And so uh, definitely us as, an, as, as Forge and Foster, we have, we're, we're getting to a size and a scale now where uh, there, there'd be no reason for us to kind of uh, not pay out that first position charge and take the hit uh, as, a, as a corporate entity. Uh, for that individual property versus uh, versus kind of the, the the portfolio as a whole, right? And so, um, I mean, the, the I think I think both products are aligned in terms of uh, the kind of on the success of the investment, and uh, we'll definitely ensure in the structuring of the investment that this is treated like any other uh, any other mortgage holder in Canada, where the ha you have those provisions for first uh, first loss capital and and a secured okay. charge against the property. Thanks. Maybe, maybe I can, maybe I can add here. I, I'm only speaking for Forge and Foster as a as a product provider. But you know, the nice thing you have is is you know, first of all, Ben is a, is a is a minority partner in Forge and Foster, so it's not you know, it's not like he's he's the biggest shareholder here. But but also, of course, you'll have the comfort that in his underwriting, he'll always look for, you know, as a CIO of Forge and Foster, he'll always look for deals where his equity is covered, right? So you know, since you are senior to him, um, you'll be more protected and he'll look out for you. So there's probably a benefit in the underwriting. In the case of dispute, you know, a lot of it, because this is registered debt, you know, is, is really in a, in a more court procedural way. Uh, he'll have to do, you know, everything he has to do as CEO of the, of the lender and, and make sure that he's getting, getting his money back. So you know, given that probably the underwriting is more important here than the the real case of default that we haven't experienced yet, we hope that the conflict is actually, you know, not negative, but more beneficial. Okay, thanks. Um, let me ask, are the tenants typically already leases signed when you do the deals? I mean, what's the, how, what's the occupancy kind of when you close on a deal? Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, yeah, so typically we, we buy income with upside and that means for us is we're usually buying, as Vincent pointed out, between five and 7% cap rates on closing with existing tenants. And our goal as asset managers is, uh, and uh, adding value is to make those five and seven caps, seven to 10 caps, add the value to the property through some of the initiatives uh, Ben was talking about to improve the property. And then at that time, um, that's where the property value increase comes from. Okay. And let me ask, in terms of your product, you said banks don't typically want to do it or banks don't want to be in the first lien. Is that, did I understand that? Uh, no, we do, we do work with banks. So uh, as Ben pointed out earlier, uh, our typical on acquisition would probably be a credit union, which is, is known as a B lender, okay. but A lenders, uh, Schedule A banks are also involved as well, uh, depending on the season and the mood. Sometimes they're more aggressive, sometimes they're less aggressive. But in general, credit unions are always in the game, um, which I, I believe uh, Ben was pointing out is trying to be replaced at this time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just I think to follow it's up on that, basically. Uh, sorry, sorry, Ben. So I'll just to follow up on that. It's, like I mentioned before, it's, it's definitely bridge capital. So like uh, in that example deal, uh, there were no leases 
there uh, there was some uh, some renovation and minor environmental work that needed to be done to to be able to get a, a, a an a, a lender on the property. And so that's kind of typically with typical to the kind of the product that we're looking for that we're we're buying. Uh, uh, a property that couldn't be financed by first position or by a AAA lender, but uh, once completed, uh, would be taken out by uh, by a kind of a, one of the big five in Canada. Okay, and how now do let you think me, of, let me sorry. qualify that because you say no leases. Yes, there was income in place. These were rolling leases, short term, uh, month to month income. Oftentimes, when tenants when we buy properties, you know, tenants pay service charge all in, so we need to separate it. So there are certain elements where, if you want an A lender from both size and from how, how the leases and the uh, asset is structured, where they just need a bit more comfort and time, where basically after our you know, initial work of a year, you have stabilized the asset to a level where you have now longer leases, a more secure you know, kind of tenant base you have, the operating cost uh, singled out. So it's, it's a much more easy to understand than product for, for an A bank. So, you know, we typically move our way up from, um, you know, B banks to A banks, and then obviously the terms get better. Okay. Let me ask, in terms of portfolio diversification, and there's a fair amount of wind geography, how do you think about the different industries? You know, I mean, I know they're not long exposures, but how much medical do you want versus, you know, I mean, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and uh, yeah, keeping uh, up to date on research is really important to us. I think that's huge in our play into the RV resorts and the manufactured homes right now uh, is, you know, with being able to work from anywhere, uh, we find a lot of opportunity in some of these uh, beautiful Ontario locations all across Ontario. Um, so that's one way we diversify is we stay up to date on the research and the trends, and then we start investing that. Uh, to diversify effectively and at which case um, we're also involved in the region in southern Ontario which has been a really good region for the past hundred years okay. and meanwhile getting on the on the assets that are growing the fastest. Okay I mean let, let me ask for this deal I'm gonna betray my I, I'm not fully up to speed on every element of this deal is this gonna be a single transaction or it's gonna be a series of of, of different projects together? Uh, so, so the, like I mentioned, the initial asset originator being being Forge and Foster, and so there'll be uh, kind of a number of different uh, um, okay. financing products that are provided to uh, to Forge and Foster. But then we definitely are interested in scaling the uh, the pool up to include other asset originators okay. across Canada and and go from there. But uh, yeah, Forge and Foster being the initial asset originator, uh, obviously having the relationship there and the comfort around the the kind of the initial. Uh, assets to be bringing into the pool and and certainly quite a bit of scale to really start the pool as well just considering the size of the portfolio understood and, um, is there going to be some kind of concentration around industry exposure at, at the portfolio level i mean when you think about medical versus rv versus I mean, yeah yeah uh, there will be for sure i, I think uh, kind of how we define it is it's it's based on the asset class and so i would say that there'll be uh uh, similar to other kind of mortgage funds, there'll be a, a percentage allocated towards uh, kind of our, our our standard offering, which would be more on the uh, commercial industrial uh, okay. being made up of like the, the flex industrial type products, the office medical type products. And then there'll be, uh, there'll be kind of the, the growth areas being the, the trailer parks, um, the RV resorts, as well as other kind of more value add type uh, commercial products. And so uh, there'll be there'll be uh, all allocations uh, split there based on uh, based on the kind of risk weighting. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question with regards to the uh, uh, the AAA lenders. Uh, what what size of deals do you need to have to approach them? It uh, it does vary, so they they'll take a look uh, they'll take a look pretty much at uh, at anything down to um, uh, kind of res like single family residential. Like it's it's less about size; it's more about security for them. Um, but uh, but definitely it, it it makes the conversations with their commercial bank commercial lenders a little more easier if you get over a certain a certain size, uh, namely being kind of like the uh, seven million and up, basically. 
um, mm -hmm. in terms of the assets. But uh, but yeah, I mean, there's 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 a lender products available for any kind of size of asset. It's it's more about the security and the and the type of asset that uh, that you're applying for, you're applying with. All right. Thank you. Apologies. Let me ask one other question, if I may. Sorry. Um, in terms, of, this is probably a Forge and Boster question. Have you had uh, what experience have you guys had since, I guess, your, your beginning around workout financial distress, how, and how do you typically manage those? If you've had any of those situations, how do you manage them? And and I guess the related question is, how do you typ typically structure a deal, you know, with covenants and triggers to get yourselves at the table? you know, in a timely manner to try to work your way out. If God forbid something goes sideways. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I can, I can take it kind of as both. Um, but uh, I guess first for Forge and Foster, there's, there's never been a, uh, a, a default on a mortgage product uh, with Forge and Foster. So we, uh, we haven't, uh, haven't done that. No restructurings, um, no like workouts, no, I mean, like even at the lease level, you know, have you had tenants where you've had to work with them beyond oh, the initial contractual terms? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Lots, I mean, in my mind, on the, tenant side. the underlying risk is really the tenants. Yeah. Right? I mean, but you get, hopefully the collateral backs it up. But yeah, how do you deal with tenants, you know, yeah. in, in financial distress? And you know, what's the typical approach and uh, your experience? That's what I really want to hear. Because at the end of the day, these assets are only valuable if you have tenants there that want, want the space and, and want to pay rent and are able to pay rent. For sure, for sure. Um, yeah, we we definitely had a few of those uh, in our in our history. But um, uh, essentially, it's 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 about mitigating risk as much as possible. So the upfront investment on our side is is capped at a at a at a certain amount. Whether if it's through like a tenant incentive program or a build out, um, we'll we'll only go up to uh, uh, we're typically somewhere between ten to fifteen percent of the, uh, the rental amount received over the duration of the contract. Um, and as part of that, we do wanna see them providing investment into the, into the unit. So there'll be a kind of a work, uh, uh, a tenant incentive or a, a renovation plan for the unit. And uh, it'll be kind of expressed on both sides who is responsible for each. So we wanna see that there's at least some capital committed from investment into the space on the tenant side. Uh, and then, uh, and then in terms of the ones where we, we've, we've kind of run into issues and, and certainly it's a, it's a pressing topic. Uh, it was a pressing topic, probably kind of 12 months or so ago when yeah. COVID hit and, and a lot of the small businesses were, were shut out. Um, I mean, fortunately the federal government was uh, quick to provide uh, kind of COVID relief loans towards rent. Um, but that was, uh, um, but that was definitely a trying time for a lot of businesses. Um, we, we generally do it on a kind of a, a couple of ways. So if, if a tenant just stops paying rent and disappears on us, we do have, uh, personal guarantees for those whose credits are, uh, uh, are, are, are there essentially. Um, sometimes there's corporate guarantees if the corporate guarantee is sufficient enough, but, uh, definitely personal guarantees there. So there is some security against the individual in that case. Um, but, uh, but we do try to just kind of limit the exposure on our side and, uh, initially, and then any exposure that is done on our end is, is usually done towards things that would be applicable for the next tenant. And so we're investing in the unit, we're investing in the, in the space. And so if another tenant does come in, it kind of just crosses off that from the, the next arrangement. But, uh, but yeah, there's some security there on the individual or the corporation, uh, depending on the credit there. And, uh, and in some cases, we just say no to tenants that don't have sufficient credit um, or uh, maybe have some uh, kind of through some research of looking at historical information that had some issues like this in the past. So we'll say no to those that are a bit of a uh, kind of a risk in terms of uh, that, that side. But uh, let me ask a couple more ballpark numbers. What percent of your tenants do you think have issues where they, they're not making their full payments and you, you have to deal with? that some is deal with in some way. Yeah. I mean, we do, we do structure payment plans um, with, with some tenants, if there's kind of stretches okay. where they're, uh, I'm where just they're uh, what percent of your tenants do you think have distress tip, you know, 
That's less 10%. than 10%, less than okay. 10% yeah, in, like, in, the, okay. in, the, in the manufactured home situations, pretty much 0% because if they don't pay, you can take away their trailer. So you even have okay. that kind of like, uh, like Ben's kind of alluding to, we often have mechanisms where it's in everyone's best interest that is pay, uh, including, okay. the, including the federal government supporting um, in, in this recent crisis. Um, so I, I've been really impressed by the resiliency of, of, of payments on that basis. And then the other thing about uh, Hamilton is the most diversified economy in Canada. So we do have one thing I've noticed is when tenants have quit um, our units, it's also it's often a knowledge economy or like a new industry that's just moves in. So it's really resilient in that way. So it's easy to get someone else in there. Typically, I mean, even if a t tenant went disappeared tomorrow. It's yeah, it's typically like somebody was storing drums or like boats, and then like now it's like a it's like a a drone company you know what i mean like it's, it's been it, because the, the area is growing fast and, and the, no, the knowledge economy is definitely in the veins of hamilton now and, and the region and the flexion as we've been doing they've been really easy conversations like hey i can't pay okay no problem i got i got this uh drone company that's gonna take your space can you leave tomorrow um and and quadruple the rent so it's it's a general uh it's a local phenomenon that the region's doing well on that basis and that is diversified but in general the knowledge economy is here and, and it's it's uh it's influencing uh, good success and easy conversations for delinquent tenants. Great, thanks a lot. Yeah, That's it's quite different too from uh, from residential as well. Like, uh, like residential markets have been getting a lot tighter, and and uh, the the kind of rules and regulations around evicting tenants who are not paying on the residential side are quite strict, and that you can kind of face challenges where you're kind of six to eight months before you can even get a hearing on on something, and so there's a Kind of more more risk there from a lost rent perspective, um, but on the commercial side, it's it's generally kind of baked into the lease, the default arrangement, and and uh, it's a much much quicker, much more efficient up, uh, kind of uh, structuring. So, great. Um, uh, that's all my questions. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Nice. Uh, regarding the poll, I was checking. There's there's there are four days left actually. And it was quite tight between the yes and the, the abstain. Uh, so unless you guys manage to really piece off, uh, well, one of the delegates that's here tonight, uh, everything should go uh, according to your plan. Yeah, hopefully that's not the case. <laughs> um, I want to be uh, conscious of everyone's time. I don't know if there are any, any last questions or, or comments before we, we close the call. Maybe even from the from the team, I think that the the community has uh, exhausted the the list of questions. Thank you, Eric, by the way. Okay, so maybe uh, yeah, Ben or Joe or Vencel, uh, what's the best way of uh, of reaching you if uh, if people have any more questions or they would like to to have a chat about this? Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, uh, I uh, think our contact information is on the, the application uh, through Reef. Um, so that'd be kind of the place to, to reach out. Uh, otherwise, uh, can kind of reach out to me directly um, at uh, my email, um, ben, just B-E-N, at uh, coral.io, C-O-R-L.io. Um, and uh, happy to answer any questions there. Nice. So thank you everyone for, for coming. It was really nice having you. Thank you. Have a nice one.